Good morning. My name is Gene Meltzer. I'm a security consultant for Symantec. Uh, and prior to that, I was working for a, a, a comp little company called AdStake, also a security consultant. I've been doing this for a very long time. Um, uh, something that I, I like to call a passion, and uh, you know, uh, during my time, uh, you know, as, as a consultant, I spent a lot of time actually doing just this, as trying to bridge the gap between security uh, and business requirements. So I think this uh, this little panel is going to be right in my sweet spot too. So I'm glad to actually sit down with you guys and talk about this. Cool, John. My name is John Amaral. I am lead architect at Retail Convergence, a startup e-commerce company. Um, prior to that, I have uh, numerous years of experience in the B2B world, uh, in both the supply chain and financial services. Um, in the past two years, I've been at Retail Convergence. It's been quite eye-opening in the B2C e-commerce world, especially in the wake of the TJX data breach and how that affected um, things at my company. So, Cool. Great. Thanks, guys. All right. So I guess what we really need is the, the announcement that says, let's get ready to rumble. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> All right, so let, I'm going to start out, when I, when I teach classes frequently, I get this question, I get, these, I get developers that say, well, look, I'd love to do all these things from a security point of view, but my manager won't let me. So I'm going to start off with Gene as the security consultant. So what we see is that trying to sell security up the chain is a tough sell because you're essentially selling them on a problem that doesn't exist, right? It, as, as Dan said this morning, it hasn't happened yet. How do you convince people that not only can it happen, but the impact is potentially huge? Well, uh, that's, uh, that's like the cruft of, of consulting, right? You're always <laughs> trying to make things better without actually having them, them being proven disastrous yet. Um, but preventive medicine have never hurt anyone, uh, and neither has preventive consulting. Uh, obviously, that's not the message that you can take to executives, and uh, they'll throw a fistful of dollars at you. Um, so uh, what you have to do is um, uh, make sure that your message um, uh, not, not only is uh, technically sound that you're actually recommending something that's feasible, um, but also you're talking to the right people. Uh, that's, that's very key in actually trying to, uh, to explain that uh, a real problem exists. Uh, uh, you can actually prove it. Uh, and if you structure your message correctly uh, and, and make sure the message delivered to the right people, I think you can be very successful in actually proving this uh, particular issue that you're trying, to, you're trying to mitigate. Okay. So the obvious follow-up question to that is, who are the right yeah. person? Who is the right person? How much, what's the right amount? Right? I'll, how about I'll start with uh, Dennis. Okay, um, that's been uh, the age-old question. Um, I really liked what Dan said earlier this morning about uh, our job in security is to try to change the future, not to explain the past. And uh, business is about taking risk. That's almost the definition of, of uh, why businesses exist. And the key is to take informed risk. Uh, senior executives are in the business of managing risk. They deal with it every day. But unfortunately, a lot of the things related to information technology risk are foreign, and people look upon those as the, the, the purview of the IT department. In getting that kind of a, of a partnership, helping, um, I, I see a, a security officer's role as two things. One is kind of taking the temperature of the organization in, in identifying and documenting and quantifying what the risk is, communicating that in aggregate to senior management, and then helping them make an informed decision about how much risk they're willing to tolerate. Um, and then communicating that back down through the organization through policies, practices, technologies, et, 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 et cetera. And there is no one right answer. I mean, different organizations, when we talk about risk, we talk about the three R's, regulations, revenues, and reputation. And businesses have different tolerances for that based on you know, the kind of regulations that apply, uh, the kind of customer expectations that apply on a revenue standpoint, and the kind of um, a reputational uh, the tolerance that, that, that they can have. Uh, one of the popular expressions that uh, it has emerged in, in, the, in the past few years is that ROI doesn't necessarily mean return on investment anymore. It can also mean risk of incarceration. Right? <laughs> and, and that takes the, 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 the fiduciary responsibility monkey off of the IT's back and, and, and puts it squarely with, with senior management, which is where, where it belongs. And our job is to help them be successful. Great. Thank you. All right. So a more specific question would be, like, let's look at it this way. If you have, say, your average 10,000 person company, maybe 1,000 of those people are IT, five of them are security people, maybe 10, if you're lucky. Right? So who, 
whose job is it really to do security? Is it the five security people? Is it the thousand IT people? Is it the re remaining 9,000 people? So I'd like to actually address the, um, this question to everybody. Just Can one I at take a time. That? You want to start with that? Yeah, yeah I, I would I, I'd love to start with that. <laughs> I mean, there's an old expression, our role as security people is not to tell people what to do, it's to teach people to think the way that we think. And in any organization, every one of those 10,000 people is a gatekeeper. We give them privileges, we give them access to things, um, and whether it's holding a door for somebody that can tailgate behind you, or sharing your uh, user ID and password with, with, with somebody, every one of those people is a gatekeeper. Every one of those people has to have uh, the mindfulness about security as part of their, their, their fabric, as part of their mission, and as part of their job description and what they're held accountable for. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I have, um, I don't disagree with that, but I do think one of the things that um, probably most of us have lived in our lifetime is that it's a real, de it really depends on what stage of a company you're at. I mean, we're talking 10,000 people here right now. What about 10 people? And um, I don't know how many of you lived in startups, and one of the things that I, my perspective on this is that a lot of what we're juggling, security and everything else, is a question of priorities, and priorities at this moment in time versus maybe later on. And, um, you know, the reality is um, the company is always trying to focus on what are the top three things we're going to do, and that changes over time. Um, I think for a lot of companies, security is not going to be in the top three list in the beginning. And that's a challenge if, you know, at, how do you weave that into the culture at the appropriate time, it, I think, is, is the challenge. Because I've certainly, you know, I would tell you when you're first getting started, when I, in, in my, I've done a couple startups over the last 10 years. Uh, one of them was a company by the name of Open Market, which is several other people have worked with me. And the, the, the risks, um, but they want the rewards. They, they're asking us for the rewards, and we, at, when we say, well, give us a couple more weeks to do X, um, they'll say, you, we, don't, we don't really want to wait those extra weeks. We want to you know, get the customers to that great sale, and we want to um, you know, get these Prada shoes out the door. So um, you know, who's really worrying about that? It is our department, because the executive team, you know, while they don't want to be incarcerated and recognize the importance of us putting the security measures in place, um, you know, they're holding to the, the bottom line right now as a startup, and, you know, that's how we're handling it. Great. No, I totally agree with what you just, uh, I guess just, just said um, in terms of uh, complexity in the startup, and, and that's, obviously it's a, an organic process when the company grows. Um, we have a lot of smart people kind of putting their heads together and uh, making the right decisions in the process, and uh, security just kind of happens, right? Uh, as a consultant, I see a lot of uh, kind of the different side of the coin where um, I'm frequently brought into a company that has um, uh, major things wrong with it with regard to security, and the company just happens to be 20 year old, you know, multi million, multi billion dollar, thousands of employees uh, company that uh, just cannot change uh, organically. Uh, it, it, you, you can tell them uh, all the great things they should be doing. Uh, and, and the heads are the heads are obviously nodding, but uh, the process to get from point A to point B is is dramatically more complex. Where they can't, they can't just throw a process out. Um, they're bound by uh, uh, government regulations. They're bound by corporate culture. They're bound by uh, the dollars already invested in the enterprise. Uh, so obviously, change can't happen overnight. Um, so that's just another twist. So that I have an interesting spin I can throw back at that. Once you've decided, as Reggie said, that. Security now is a priority. How do you bring about organizational transformation? How do you actually get everybody on board riding the same bus? Who wants to take it first? From a consultant perspective, uh, you know, all jokes aside, you know, we, we make a recommendation, and you know, uh, 20 hours later we're done. So, but that's unfortunately that's not the way the business works. We 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 are we are obligated to help our clients. So. Um, what we have to do, obviously, is the message that we, we structure has to be the, not only the correct message, but it has to also be uh, uh, packaged correctly and delivered to the people that are most receptive to, to change and understand what we're actually recommending. Um, beyond that, the recommendations that we have to provide, um, while they have to be sound security solutions, we absolutely cannot provide pie in the sky recommendations. Um, we all know that encryption uh, is great. We all know that uh, massive authentication is a wonderful thing. Uh, there's lots of great technologies that exist to solve numerous security problems. Unfortunately, um, 
larger clients, lar larger companies are unable to um, take those messages and say, all right, well, we're going to implement them and uh, everything is going to be fine. Uh, the best they can do is say, we're going to take these solutions and maybe in five years we'll be 50% there. Uh, so un unfortunately, um, that's not good enough. So um, a lot of the time we kind of have to play um, sort of uh, give them, a, not really a menu, but sort of a, a plan saying do these things right now, do these things six months from now, do these things a year from now, and eventually you'll get, by taking these baby steps, you'll get to the point where you should be. Right. So John, you're down in the trenches. When you're, when you're in the, your day-to-day -day activities and you're, you, you have to meet your deadlines, you have to get things out the door, you have to ship product, how do you deal with it? Like when you get, get that you need security, how do you manage to sliver it in? Well, it's, it's basically skunk work projects, it really is. Um, you know, uh, when we walked in the door, the, the previous panel was finishing up when they were talking about centralizing your security APIs. And one of the things that you know, I started doing when I first joined Retail Convergence was um, as each new project goes out the door, pulling more and more security into a more centralized API kind of realm. Um, but at the same time, you know, it is all skunk works. Uh, the business loves it, but they want to get those product shoes out the door. So. Um, for, for, I mean, I, I don't know if I've answered your question completely, but it's, um, you know, we recognize the importance of it um, from both network operations side and for me from a, from a, you know, the code standpoint and the customer facing side. Here, here's something to make it more controversial. Is that how you would like it to be? No, obviously, <laughs> obviously not. Um, besides the fact that, you know, I'd, I'd rather spend more time with my wife at home rather than doing the skunk work <laughs> projects in order to meet both my internal deadlines for, um, you know, better architecture and the company's deadlines for uh, more sales. Cool. Yeah, I mean, my perspective, if you're going to have, it's got to come from the top. You have got to have executive support. Um, I'm not sure you need the CEO walking around every day saying this is going to be our top priority, but it's got to come from the top. It's got to be at the top of the organization that has the security, you know, the, the, the key implementers happening, and it's got to come with budget teeth. Te the CFO's got to buy in, and there's got to be dollars allocated and people and resources allocated, and it's got to end up on, I mean, just like every other priority, usually priorities get woven into goals and objectives for the year and they get woven into things like compensation and bonuses. And if this is getting to that kind of level of importance, it needs to be in all of those programs. So it becomes pervasive across the organization. Everybody gets it. Everybody's measured and incented based on it. And it becomes a real initiative with um, executive support, budget support, and probably incentive support. At the, um, and certainly, we are living in an environment now where um, boards are worrying about this because of the fiduciary responsibility. We've had so many high-level breaches that have ruined companies or their reputations or set them back significantly that as a board member, I can tell you, we right now in our audit committee charter, the rules about how we run this one important committee of the board, we have a responsibility to deal with IT security. It's a requirement. And so you're at a level that Boards are asking about it. They don't have the same conflicts that you have inside a company about priorities. You know, I don't have the same day-to-day -day worrying about this feature versus this security thing because that's not my focus. I'm at a higher level. I'm worrying about fiduciary responsibility. Is the company's reputation at risk or whatever? And, you know, so at the board level, you're saying make it happen. You know, or you get a presentation and you say, I don't think it's happening, and I don't really think we have the right risk profile here, and, and I'm not encumbered anymore by the day-to-day -day realities of what the trade-off is. I mean, that's the problem with priorities. There's always a trade-off, right? You, you know, there's limit, limited resources, limited time, limited whatever, and it's all about trade-offs. When you're inside the company and you have customer, you know, your customer screaming at you for a feature, and you have your security guy saying, oh, but we need to worry about this, um, you know, who wins out? I mean, I think we've already see, all seen that. But these days, the board doesn't have that worry. They just say, make it happen. So I think there's some really, um, there's real some advantages. And I, I think many of you will find an opportunity to present at the board level. And a lot of that is about um, communicating what the risk really is. I can tell you, you know, every day as a CFO or a board member, you're managing all kinds of big problems or thinking about big problems. And some of the question in security is, 
making that, that security risks real enough that I appreciate what the issue is. I mean, and some of that's about talking the right language. If somebody comes to me and talks about I need to be PCI compliant and all this kind of stuff, okay, I don't really know what that means. If somebody says to me, we have a risk that people can get to our customer information and we can get sued and here's the impact of what that could happen to us, I get that. So a lot of this is about making the risk really real and understandable to the people who are your decision makers and talking in the right language. Great. I've personally had the opportunity to be on the other side of the of the table at an audit committee meeting as the security officer. And <clears throat> it was a very interesting, excuse me, it was a, a very interesting exercise because trying to explain what it is that we do in business terms was, was a challenge. I mean, you can't go in there speaking about uh, technologies or, or anything else. You, you have to really be able to articulate and quantify wh what some of the business risks are. The definition of policy is formal statement of management intent. Every business is run by policy. And that doesn't come out of the IT department. It really needs to come out of senior management. Our job is to teach people to think the way that we think. I spend most of my day, both in my previous <coughs> life in industry and, and at, at the university, I spend most of my day teaching. It, a lot of it's informal. But it's helping people to develop an informed opinion about what the risks are and make a conscious decision about how much risk that we're willing and, and able to tolerate. It goes far beyond technology. I just came out of Rich Mogul's session on uh, data, data leakage prevention, DLP. I just thought that was something else. But, uh, the, 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 uh, um, and if you look at where DLP happens, so much of it happens outside of things that security can directly, or um, that the security and, and technology can, can directly control, that it has to be a management directive. A well-intentioned employee taking a disk drive with all your customer information home so that they can do work on their own time seems like a good idea, but it puts the entire enterprise at, at risk. Okay, and those kind of things, we, we can't be there to influence every decision that every one of our 10,000 employees uh, makes. We need to make it, I, I totally agree with, with, with the point about, people do what they're incented to do. If your goals and objectives, if your job description, if your reward program is based on doing some of these things, you will do them. If not, um, you will gravitate toward um, what your goals and objectives and, and your business incentives are. And that's why to get to the next level, we've taken technology, and, and we talked about this, or, or you heard it in some of the presentations this morning, we've taken the technology solutions in some cases about as far as we can take them. The next generation of things that are, are, are uh, uh, Kurzweil, uh, you know, uh, singularity type things where we have uh, sentient technology, maybe that will solve the, the, the next layer of problems. But I, th I think we're right in between right now, and the people part are the weakest link in the chain. Great. So if I just may add a couple of things. Um, so um, I agree with everything that's been said so far, uh, and I also frequently find myself on the other side of the table where... It's a panel you're not supposed to agree. Okay. <laughs> I happen to agree on that only point well, that from only now on. <laughs> Um, so I frequently find myself on uh, the other side of the table as well where uh, I'm asked, um, I, I'm, I'm telling the executives that you have a particular vulnerability and it opens your customers to some kind of a risk. Uh, therefore, you should do something about it like fix it or uh, plan to fix it. Um, and so what I find frequently, uh, especially lately, is that it happens to be not enough. Um, lately, the questions that come back to me uh, from across the table are, well, how much of it is it really of a risk? Not only can you prove it, yes, of course we prove it. We wouldn't be telling you this if we didn't have tangible proof that it exists. Um, so not only can you prove it, but tell me, tell me more about this. Um, how much of it is of a risk? What do I stand to lose? Um, if I, if in the event that this vulnerability does get exploited, um, what are the real uh, effects of this? Um, besides the fact that you know a name being plastered in the Wall Street Journal, how much money am I going to lose? Um, on the flip side. How much money uh, are, you know, are you insured 
against the loss particular or, or, or what are the mitigating controls that exist for, for example to mitigate a particular vulnerability. So it's a lot more than just well, uh, what's the chance it's going to happen. That's the first thing I would say. What's my probability that this is going to happen? Is this a 1% chance? Is this a 10% you know? Probability right and also the impact right. Um, well, it pr yeah, chance is going to happen and what's the impact if it happens. Right. right. So it's, it's a lot more than just uh, I right. think you know, here's a vulnerability fix it. Got well, it. because, you know, if you're, if you're an executive in a company, you have hundreds of these decisions to make all the time. And you have limited resources, because unfortunately, every recommendation you get from your consultant costs money. I've never had one that doesn't cost <laughs> money. Um, and so, you know, you know, you have a set amount of money to spend, and you're trying to decide what are my best investments of my available cash based on my high priority items. And, you know, you usually have some absolutes, you know, there's certain things you absolutely have to do. But, yeah, it's all about weighing in the risk side. It's how much risk do I have? What's the impact of the risk? Can I live with the risk or the ramifications that it happens? Um, or can I not live with it? Do I need to invest the dollars? Or what are my alternative uses of those dollars? I mean, that's kind of the decision. So the only way you can make that decision is to get all the information that that um, Gene was just describing so that you can weigh that against the 50 million other things that people ask you for. Right. So here's, here's a good follow-up. I'm hearing slightly different things from both sides, so this is a good time to turn the screws a little bit. We frequently hear from the, 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 the implementa uh, implementers, the technical folks, that management doesn't understand. And we frequently hear from management that these guys don't know how to communicate. You know, as an industry, we're not terribly good at that all the time. So on this side, what I'd like to ask is, what is the thing you want management to get? You know, a lot of times we say they don't get it. What, don't you, what do you want them to get to do things differently? And from, from this side, what I'd like you to hear, what hear from you is, how would you like them to communicate it better so that you understand? So I'll start over on this side. Well, actually, for me, um, <laughs> the funny thing is, it actually came to me in a fortune cookie. Um, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> It's uh, the, the, the fortune read, the expedient thing and the correct thing are seldom the same thing. And for, for us, you know, that's, especially in a startup world, you know, that's the battle that we have with every project, every requirement. Um, it's the, the battle of getting it out the door versus getting it out the door the right way. Um, and so it's just, it's the communication to them. I mean, they... My, you know, my executives get it. They understand uh, the risk of incarceration comment, but um, they, as I said before, they, you know, they, they're for speed. They're for mark, getting to market, um, and it's just trying to communicate to them that just it doesn't have. Well, I'm not talking months. I'm not, it doesn't take two months to get this little piece of functionality in. Just give us a couple of extra weeks, and it'll just be that much better. Um, so that's why it ends up with skunk works. Okay. Yeah. I guess one thing that I'd like uh, to, to constantly get across the table when I'm delivering projects and, and, uh, and working for clients is that, you know, while it's fine that um, the vulnerabilities that we, we, we find and recommendations that, that we uh, give to our clients, having fixed all those things, yes, they'll be somewhere they'll be a little bit better. Um, we can't obviously quantifiably say as consultants that you'll be 10% better or, you know, a shade of orange better or something like that. But um, what I'm trying to say is that uh, I'm always um, hoping that the management across the table will reach out and say, well, having seen these vulnerabilities, um, can you please help us understand how to get to the root cause of these vulnerabilities? We know they exist, and they'll always exist. We fix them today, they'll be, they'll be something else in six months from now. Uh, and as a consultant, it's fine to play whack-a-mole. I mean, obviously, uh, we get paid for, for coming in and, <laughs> and assessing systems and finding vulnerabilities, and it's fine. But ultimately, uh, that's a game without end. Uh, it benefits consulting, but um, the reality is that the companies are still vulnerable. So um, the message that I always try to get across is that help us come in uh, and work through these vulnerabilities, understand why they exist in the first place. Uh, is it a lack of training? Is it a cultural thing? Is it because the management kind of missed um, the, you know, the security drivers uh, a couple of years from now and doesn't understand where the security market is going and what needs to be done? Uh, is there a disconnect between uh, executive management um, uh, man technical management and developers somewhere along the line where you know one group thinks one thing and the developers are doing completely another thing um, uh, so my goal is always to strive to uh, to talk and understand what is actually going on what's behind these vulnerabilities 
So before we, before, we, before we just walk out the door and help, you know, have the client just fix the vulnerabilities, um, we want to make sure we understand what the, what's the root cause. Why is that actually happening? Got it. All right. So where's the disconnected communication? Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, um, I, 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 I don't know the technical language. I don't understand the security rules, and I'm never going to. And that doesn't mean I'm turning it off. It's just, you know, it's mm -hmm. not going to be an area of expertise that I could ever really understand. So. I do think in the terms of risks, and so I want to understand what is the risk really, okay? What really are we talking about? And sometimes that's dollars, you know, this is what it could cost us. Sometimes it's reputation, and I need to understand that, and I need to understand, and then I need to understand, so I need to understand what the risk is that could, what could really happen um, that hurts our business in business terms. And as I said, it's not always money. Sometimes it's money. Sometimes it's our customer. We could lose all of our customers because our, you know, our reputation is so important and this is, you know, this is an issue. Um, so I need to understand it in, in real consequences. What are the consequences? I need to understand um, what the reward is for, you know, what are the, so I need to, the, the costs associated with if we don't do it and what is the benefit if we do do it. And sometimes with security, the benefit is you just don't have the cost, right? And sometimes that's as good as it gets, right? Um, you know, but it's not that different than CFO land, you know, in CFO land, your best answer, things are going great if nobody's complaining, usually. You know, nobody walks into me and says, you did a great job on payroll this week. You know, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> um, so I do get the sometimes no problems is a good thing. Um, but so I just need to understand the risk. And I need to not just understand the worst case, I need to understand the probable case. And so I do need to understand probabilities. You know, is this a high chance, and it doesn't have to be exact percentages, but is this a high chance of happening or is this a low chance of happening? Um, and uh, because that's what we're, when we're weighing, it's always the weighing, cho you're always cho choosing between this and something else. Um, and the other thing, I do care about um, what's my programmatic, systematic approach to help solve problems like these. So it's okay if someone comes to me and says, we have a really big vulnerability and it's this and we need to fix this. But I do care about, okay, I don't want to be in crisis mode all the time about every little fix, you know, every time we have a crisis. I want to understand a program. What do we need to do to create a program and a culture that's going to try to minimize the amount of crises we have um, in this area? Because um, you know, nobody likes to operate at the executive level fighting fires all the time. You'd much rather know a little bit ahead of time, this is how we need to invest, maybe in, a, in an ongoing way, this is going to take, and if we do that, we can probably minimize fires. So I do want to hear about that. Now, when the fire's happening, I probably have no time for that, right? Um, but um, so there, is, there are times to talk about that, um, the programmatic approach, and I want to hear that somebody's thinking about that, but with some business language associated with so that um, you know, you understand where I'm coming from, which is we have to fight, you know, the problem at, at the CFO level or the board member level, we don't ever get any easy problems because those ones are already solved somewhere else. I mean, everything that comes up that you're dealing with is a really hard one. Um, and so the challenge is to make one hard choice versus another choice. In general, vulnerabilities come from that old uh, cliche about the emergent properties of complex systems. Things, doing things that weren't intended by the developer. We rarely, t rarely test for that. We rarely make security or privacy a feature of, of applications as we develop them. Um, and it's up to the hackers to find all the flaws after, after we, we deploy things. And if I could do one thing as a security person, is for every program that gets developed, every process that gets put in place, every policy, every procedure, um, to work with the people doing that. Look at it critically. Put the time in to do it right the first time. And to apply the lessons learned that lots of people who have researched this, people like Andy Jakewith and, and Hugh Thompson and, and Dan did a lot of this kind of work at, at, at At Stake, that it's cheaper to develop software correctly the first time in terms of life cycle cost than it is to add all of the patches and all of the other things on after the fact. But we never look at it that way. 
You know, we never look at you know, the horizon of the entire life cycle of a system or a program or a process or a, or, or, or a procedure. We rush things to market and then, and then we, we worry about that later on. And again, that's part of our education process. I mean, will we ever get to the board members and say we, we should have, you know, we should run software through uh, a threat vector analysis early in the process? Probably not. But if we get the kind of direction that you know, one of the things that we're held accountable for is to deploy secure software to begin with, that that, that really is a cultural value of, of of our company, then we have the, the the air cover to work with IT and really make some of those things happen. Uh, that 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 the, there really is some accountability. The other thing I'll say. Is early on in my career, I met with a senior executive and we were talking about security and he said, young man, we will never do everything perfectly. And it made me think of the difference between efficiency and effectiveness. Efficiency, doing things right. Effectiveness, doing the right things. And one of the things that we get tasked with is helping our organizations identify what are the things that we can do that will have the highest return. Uh, and we, you can't try to boil the ocean. You can't go after everything. Um, but when you get in an organization, you see what some of the things are. It can't all be done overnight. It usually involves putting a, a multiple year program together. Um, but working with management and getting some small victories and, 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 and start, starting to uh, uh, identify some measurable, demonstrable changes. Again, going back to the point that our job is to change the future, not to explain the past. Got it. So I, I have lots more questions, but does anybody in the audience have something they want to throw out? I know that there's at least a couple of hecklers here. You have a mic runner, please. This is directed at our uh, CFO representative on the panel. Sorry about that. Um, did I hear you correctly to, to say that um, there's a distinction between you hearing about PCI compliance and that versus uh, the risk of being sued? And I only ask that because we were in a scenario um, and we're, we're one of those behemoth companies, you know. Tons of, of, of uh, employees, 40,000 plus, uh, old ways of doing things, and um, basically the acting CFO uh, put a blockade on any uh, controls, knowing, you know, with no, the rest of us knowing that PCI compliance was right around the corner. Finally, when the, when the new CIO comes in, uh, things get green lighted, but now we're so far down in the process, there's ramifications of not being compliant, ready, and uh, so what? What's want to hear, you know? Yeah, I mean, my point is less about you know, PCI compliant and more about, I don't know what that means. Okay, let's assume, so it's a language issue, right? Um, I mean, I, I, I need to know that if we're not PCI compliant, we're not gonna be able to get customers in the financial services industry, which is a key segment that we're targeting. That's what I need to hear is that, you know, so I'm not necessarily gonna understand the gory details of what, what that means, especially if it's lingo oriented. So that's really my point. It's not that I don't care about it. I, I do care about it if it matters on some of the, one of the priorities of the company. I just, when, when you're talking to me, if you talk too lingo oriented, you lose me, right? And it's just like anybody. If, you know, if I talk to you about accounts payable and you know, that kind of stuff, you'd probably say, oh, snoozer. When I tell you about your paycheck, you probably care, right? So there we go, right? So it's all about getting the language and the communication right. Cool. I think Dan has the mic. Um, yeah, I understand uh, this is not corroborated in the um, formal sense, but I understand now from two sources that the Australian equivalent of the of FASB, or the Financial Accounting Standards Board, um, is considering a proposal to require intangible property be a balance sheet item, that it actually appear there. And since I assume that data, per se, would be an intangible asset and would have to therefore be included if you actually found as an accounting rule that intangibles had to be listed on the balance sheet. It, it's, a, it's a sort of question, and it isn't just for you, uh, Reggie, but perhaps in general, the, the, the issue of we, can't, we don't know how to value data has maybe solved by requiring us to do it in some way. And where does that lead? Because I, I know that, back to the people speaking the common language, what's it worth is a common language we haven't got. Right, yeah, I mean, I, I think, um the concept of putting assets on the balance sheet and talking about them that are not easily valued is already happening. Um, it's, it's happening primarily with financial institutions 
and we hear about and probably I'm sure everyone has heard about all of the problems the banks are having these right these days with securities that they are having to take billions of dollars of losses on um, and what they're doing is fair valuing their current at their securities based on what the market conditions now the champ the, the benefit that they have is they actually have a market to measure it on but you do have certain industries are being asked to put all of their assets on the balance sheet and adjust them based on changes in value um, what you're talking about now is going to be, I, I can't see it happening anytime soon, even though people are talking about, people have, the accounting world has talked about making every business have a fair value balance sheet showing all the assets and liabilities of the company. And when you talk about things that are intangibles like data, customer data, like software that might not be on the balance sheet, like customer lists and the value of your customer relationships, um, trademark, you know, there's a lot of things right now that are not typically on the balance sheet unless you buy a company and then you try hard to figure out what you bought. Um, I don't see it happening anytime soon because I don't even know how we would possibly measure or value that kind of asset on a consistent basis company to but company because that's one of the challenges. Investors want to look at a balance sheet and know that the rules are being followed the same when they look at company A and company B. And if they're using different methodologies to value their assets, it's going to be hard. So I think it's going to be hard. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't pin hopes on that, that being um, a solution anytime soon. One of the uh, challenges and tugs of war that I've seen is I've been brought in to do policy development for companies, and I'm usually brought in by the technical organization. So as part of the suite of policies, I want to say things like an acceptable use no storing of data classified as patient health information, proprietary, all this goes on mobile devices or goes home. For system and network administration, I want to make guidelines that this can't go on the DMZ and data based on the classification, these are the controls you need. But nobody's classifying the data. The business groups are saying, no, we don't want to do that. And we also want to have a business owner who's responsible for reviewing that data and where it's stored and getting together with the technical people and saying, no, that doesn't belong in that public FTP server. That's information. So how would you address that kind of issue? Yes. Uh, data classification has been the Achilles heel of information security from, from the very beginning. Um, there are companies, um, and there are actually a couple of universities that I'll tell you about privately, um, that I think are doing a really good job of this, of identifying, because now that I'm in the academic space, I, I, there's some things I was, I was pleasantly surprised to find, um, are getting to the point where they identify a custodian role and a steward role and, um, and, and a, you know, senior executive responsibility. And those are the people who are actually responsible for the data, who set the policy for that data. Um, and, and it's, those organizations are making huge leaps forward in terms of their, of their security. But you're absolutely right, until that's done, having a policy that says, we have this standard of care for this type of information, if it's not classified, it's really not, not of, of great value, so. Here's one I'll throw out there for the, the, the panel. So you've had an incident. What do you do now? Right, we've we talked a lot about theoretical of, you know, how do you prepare for it? How do you plan for it? How do you teach people? How do you enroll them in wanting to participate in security? But forget about that now. You've had an incident, a real one. What do you do? John, what have you seen? Well, fortunately, um, We've never had an incident, not only at the, the company I'm at now, but also in the previous startups. Actually, that's not true. Um, my very first startup I worked for, our website was hacked by the Chinese. Um, we got the FBI involved, all that the fun stuff. But what, what amazed me was um, it didn't really change much of the mindset of uh, the management team. Um, again, it was to the point of, well, what, what can we do to, to plug that hole? But there was no data loss. There was no uh, customer sensitive information loss because it, it was mostly B2B at the time anyway. Um, and for them, it, it, it kind of went to Reggie's point of what's the possibility of that happening again? What's the risk versus uh, what's you know, getting the market share, getting, uh, you know, being the leading supply chain vendor of this, you know, software at the time. Um, even today, like the, with the TGX data breach, you know, we have no idea what would happen if, if, or how to even react if something like that happened to us. Um, the, partly, I think, uh, you know, is it's 
it's almost mind blowing. Of you know, we we put all these security places in step, and and and, um, and for something like that to happen, it would have to be an inside job. You know, at our, at, at the point now that that where we are, um, and you know, you're working side by side with these people. You you trust them. You know, you almost especially in a startup, you're almost family. You know, how do you go to work the next day knowing that you were just betrayed by? <laughs> yeah, so and then you know then the, the legal fallout and the financial fallout of that especially for a startup you know what happens then right. it's hard I, I can't answer it um, but there is one point I do want to make I know we're running short on time um, if it, the, the top has kind of got switched back and forth um, and I just want to make the point of education uh, G made the point earlier that encryption is, is kind of common sense well it's common sense for everyone in this room um, but you know, we recently worked with a contractor who delivered a version one piece of software and you, it would blow your mind on the stuff that we assumed was common sense to them um, but you know clear text passwords I mean everything that you, that you just know that's common sense you don't do uh, you know they did it and I think for us you know having some sort of training certification program I hired someone from Raytheon so you know that you know security was the forefront uh, at Raytheon, but it's different. It's not the same as B2C. Um, and, and some of the decisions and, and designs that this person came up with um, didn't have that kind of framework in mind. They weren't thinking about customer sensitive information. They, weren't, they were thinking about you know, all the stuff that they did at Raytheon, um, which wasn't as sensitive. So I think the, the point that I want to make, it kind of didn't answer your question, but um, you know, I think more emphasis from top to bottom has to be made on security training, and I think it has to be made earlier in a person's career. I, I, I was lucky enough to, to be involved early in my career on customer sensitive information, um, but you know, I didn't learn that in college. I learned that shortly thereafter. And if if more organizations kind of had that um, in mind, I wouldn't have to be, or our CFO wouldn't be worrying as much as he has to, uh, given Rob? Okay. what we have. Yep. Can, can I make a comment on that? I'm actually very proud. Uh, Brandeis has started um, in um, the, um, the Graduate School of Continuing Education uh, an information assurance program. I think it's absolutely fantastic um, to have a program that's not just for technologists, but it's for uh, executive types that can go and understand what are the, 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 the things that we can do to ensure uh, the, the information of our business and, and to start to look at that as, a, as an asset. And I would, I would in, invite you to look at the Brandeis program and, and, and similar programs. And, and if there are people in your organization to put them through that kind of a program, please do. Great. All right, we have a couple more minutes, I guess. Gene, one more minute for you and maybe um, one sure. more uh, final thoughts. Going back to, to Rob's question, what to do when you've had a break in? Well, natural first reaction is you have to stop the bleeding, right? That's, everybody knows that. That's a, that's a simple step. Um, the, the, I've seriously bumped into multiple situations where you know, I've asked the same question to the client. Well, what's next? What do we do now? We've, we've plugged this, we applied this patch, we've you know, closed this firewall port. What do we do now? Uh, and it's, it's not an easy answer, right? What do you do now? Well, um, what you should be doing is really taking a harder, deeper look at, at, at the organization and the, the source of the failings that, that came about. Um, is it the lack of training that you're lacking? Is, it, uh, is, there, is there a gap in the SDLC, in the SDLT process? Is there an SDLC process? Um, is your application uh, team uh, just not following the policies that have already been written and deployed? Um, uh, it's, it's a perfect opportunity to kind of sit back and evaluate yourself and your company to why these issues exist in the first place. Uh, and the reason why that's a good start to do it is because you have most of the company on board at this time. The executives know about the break-in. Um, everybody knows about it. Everybody wants to make it better. And you'll get not a, not a, never get a better point of support for a security drive other than that, that you know, except for that point. Everybody's, everybody wants to help. Everybody wants to make things better. And I think you can make the most progress at that point. So it's a perfect opportunity to sit back and, and evaluate uh, your, your overall security structure and organization. Got it. Um, yeah, I, I act absolutely agree with Gene. I was going to say a, a crisis situation is a moment of opportunity. 
That's the bottom line from my perspective um, in two ways. The first one is solving the problem. I mean, when you have a crisis, I mean, the people that gain credibility are the ones who are calm, collected, and work on solving the problem and get it done. No blaming at that point and no, like, I told you we should have done that. That doesn't really help. But, um, you know, the problem solved, well, you get it done, you, you, um, you can be involved in helping establish your credibility. And, and after the dust settles, when people are over it, it's an, a really big opportunity to say, let's now talk about how we stop this from happening again, and let me show you a programmatic approach to how we might do this. We can't fix it overnight. It's, this is not like I need $2 million today to solve this problem, but let, you've, get, you've got a moment of credibility to really say, here's how I think we need to change the way we do things, and we can do it on a programmatic approach. Mm -hmm. And that's when you're going to have you're going to have awareness. People are going to understand. I mean, I think I talked earlier that one of the big challenges in this area is is having an executive team really understand what the consequences are of the problem. And you now they get it now. They've just went through what the consequences are, and it had whatever disruption on the business. So you, you you're past that initial problem of uh, the understanding of consequences, and it's a real moment of opportunity. But it, it, it has to be, you know, I, I don't think that's where you totally take advantage and say, as I said, I need, you know, $5 million today or whatever. I mean, I think it's much more creditable to say, let's talk about how we change behavior and we create a programmatic approach. And that's going to be um, very well received. It's also very important to think about an incident response plan before something happens. Um, I mean, just because you haven't had a fire on campus, um, there are well-documented procedures in place of what to do if there were a fire. And it's real hard to invent things like that on the fly. There's lots of, if you're interested, I can um, send you uh, links to lots of things that have been published in, in the open source community and, and in, in higher education. If you don't have an incident response plan, uh, put something in place that you at least have a playbook to follow. Cool. All right, so hopefully this has been a little bit enlightening and fun and entertaining. and. What I'd like to just end with is a call to action. You know, this conversation needs to continue. There's always this balance between business and security, and it's like one of these tipping scales that if you put a little bit too much on one side, it, it, go, it f falls off. So what I would encourage you to do is just keep this conversation going as you leave the room and as you go out into your environments that you, where you work. Because it's, it's the group in here, I think, gets it, but you need to get the message out. So ev go off and ev evangelize, please. Thank you.